Most of us have trained to let our mind rule our bodies. But is there wisdom in what our bodies can tell us? Find out what our desire for food, sex, and spirit can teach us about ourselves. And on our green tips, glass recycling. Next on Living Smart. wonder why it's so difficult to stay on a diet or remain married or why there's an increasing number of depressed people in America. Dr. Kimura Lamoth believes it has to do with the wrong approach in life. A mother, author, philosopher, and dancer, Dr. Lamoth can be considered a Renaissance woman. Her doctorate is in theology from Harvard and she has also taught there and Brown University. Her latest book, What a Body Knows, Finding Wisdom and Desire, explores the healing wisdom in the movements of our desires for food, sex, and spirit. Welcome to Living Smart. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Patty. We talked about movement. You have five children, and I'm assuming that they taught you a lot about movement. Yes. And desire for movement. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. <laughs> little ones you have. Uh, yes, well, they, the ones. oldest is 14. Mm -hmm. So 14, 12, 8, 4, and 7 months at the moment. And I guess the moment that I would note first was happened with my third child was actually in my belly and it was at that point that I got the idea for dancing a dance pregnant mm -hmm. and that was the first solo concert I did it was called Genesis and it was an amazing experience to me because being pregnant as a dancer I've had years of training right. in dance but then all of a sudden being pregnant your body's different and what it helps you to do is all of a sudden Open up your awareness of things you weren't before, including right. your hips, you know, and your weight, <laughs> and getting your weight right. down. Right. Right? right, right, right. And it gave me permission to choreograph in a way that I hadn't experienced before. Why did you feel a need to write a book about desire and the wisdom of desire for food, sex, and, and religion or faith or whatever? It, it really comes from my love of dance. Okay. I might have been born a dancer, but I didn't discover it until I was in college. And by that time, I had already gotten very excited about the life of the mind as well. And in my dance experiences, and in the practice of dance that I was doing, I became aware that I was learning things and understanding things and knowing things that I hadn't been able to learn anywhere else. And the philosopher part of me started to get interested in this and right. say, why is it that our culture has such a hard time appreciating the body as right. having something to teach us? Right. And in particular, the moving body right. as having something to teach us. And so that got me started in looking around at culture in different places to try to figure out what kind of values, assumptions, and ideals are there around about what our bodies are, who we as human beings mm -hmm. are, and what role our bodies play in that. And you say that there's nothing wrong with desire. The problem is that we, we have a negative connotation of desire. Now, when, why do we do that in the first place? Yes. Why is it negative? And why do we think mind over body is more important than body over mind? It's a, it's a long and complicated history, but I think you're right. The core of it, as I see it, is that Desire is not the problem, but the problem is that we make desire the problem. That has long roots. Many religious traditions, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, they all have strong traditions in which desire is a problem. Desire is associated with temptation. It's forbidden. It will cause us to sin. Now, those ideas about desire have permeated through our culture. But as I started to investigate in the history of the modern West in particular, to try to answer this question, you know, mm -hmm. why do we think about our bodies and desire the way we do, I kept coming back to the fact that the practices that we do day on a daily basis from morning to night right. encourage us to identify with our thinking minds and encourage us to feel and act as if we were thinking minds. And so even more than the belief structures that we have in inherited are the practices that we do. And, and you think that's very important, and, 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 and this goes back to, okay, thinking mind, but, but the body can teach us about senses. Yes. And movement can teach us that we're alive. Yes. Why is that important? Because your, your, your book is really an ode to movement. It is. It's really about the power of movement. And movement for me is a practice that brings our senses to life. It brings our senses to life. Our senses are always there. But when we think about our bodies as objects, we tend to think of the senses as just gateways, that somehow whatever's there I see or I hear or I smell. And we don't realize or we don't remember that our senses actually get educated 
over a period of time. And whatever we're doing in any moment of every day is training us how to see something and not see something else. Right. How to notice it, how to interpret it, how to value it. And if we're not doing practices like movement that, that draw us down into our bodies, we just don't learn that it's important. We I, don't learn how to value it. We don't have a lived experience of it as being important. And you're very, very particular about we have to move. Yes. If you don't move, you're like a dead body. Right. Dead fish. Well, a, move, a body that is not moving is not a body. It's a corpse. Right. <laughs> right. right. And, and right. That, the importance, of, and, and as a society, we're, we're moving less and less. You're right. very critical of a sedentary life. Yes. Why? Well, let me put it this way. I feel like Western culture has developed one trajectory of human experience in a very profound and powerful way. And that is our capacity to develop our thinking minds, our capacity to abstract, to remove ourselves from our bodies and solve all kinds of problems. And we do. The, the, however, the problem is that we are bodies. Right. Right? We don't have right. bodies, we are bodies. And those bodies that we are, are moving. They're always beating, breathing, snapping, crackling, charging, even when we're asleep. And that movement is constantly allowing us to think. So if we're only thinking, but not doing movements that take us back down into our bodies, opening up our senses, then our thinking becomes thinner. Mm -hmm. And our thinking and the way in which we go about tackling problems loses some of the richness and the resources that are there for us in our bodily selves. And that's why also it's so, so important. You keep saying, be in touch with your body. Be in touch right. with your body because that, that's so important. Right. But and I try to even move away from the idea of body. Like in, in the book, I try to talk about our bodily self, for example, or the bodily dimensions of ourself because that word body ends up making ourselves, our bodily selves, into objects again. Right. <laughs> and right. it's something that we have to resist because our language does it so easily. Now, you, you value movement. You also talk about deep breathing. Why is yes. deep breathing so important to, to be more in touch with your body and your senses? Right. Breathing is one of the most basic movements of our bodily selves. So in every movement, in every moment, we are breathing in and out. And that movement, that exhalation and that inhalation affects our whole bodily self. And if we tune into that particular movement, it becomes a gateway for us for understanding the power of movement in all aspects of our life. So that's kind of why I focus on breathing. But there's another reason as well, and that is, if you go out and start moving, you actually need to breathe. <laughs> right, 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 right. And right. if you start opening up your breath and releasing the tension that you have in your body, you find that you want to move. So there's also, breathing is a kind of movement which actually is a catalyst for, for movement. <laughs> discovering other kinds of movement. So um, when we breathe when we're walking, or we breathe when we're running, or we breathe when we're biking, we end up finding more in those movement patterns than we would have otherwise. You talk about something that's very problematic in our culture, and that is depression. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and you find the reasons why. Share, share with us and, and what some, some of the solutions you've seen. Yes. I feel like um, depression, as I see it, is a spectrum. And they're very, and so we have sure. to uh, acknowledge that. that. Mm -hmm. But there is a, there are, it is an epidemic <laughs> right, right now, right. The, the number of depressed people are. And what is depression? Depression is a feeling of low energy, a feeling of alienation, and not feeling a sense of who you are, why you're here, why it matters. And what I feel that is telling us is that those are, those are sensations of frustration and irritation that are inviting us to move in ways that won't recreate them. And so they fall under the category of what I call the desire for spirit. And spirit I understand as the vitality, the sense of direction, the sense of belonging that get us up out of bed in the morning, that let us know that there's something that's worth doing and have us feel that it's a part of a larger um, entity. And, and there's a lot, okay, so if that's the problem, the depression, mm -hmm. the sort of the low energy, the alienation, right. the lack of spirit, right. and not necessarily spiritual, but the lack of vital right, spirit. Right, the energy um, force, yeah. Right. Then and and they, we want to interpret this as an invitation to move. There are a lot of aspects of our culture that actually are trying to address this. Right. You can see a lot of movements, uh, a lot of uh, efforts in the New Age movement. Right. You can see a lot of efforts in in the medicalization of depression. Um, and so, what I wanted to do was sort of look at the discussion that was happening around this depression and say, what's missing? Right. And if you look. There's, all, there's the, always this sense that if you just found the right practice or the right belief or the right drug, then maybe you'd be able to... Handle your depression. Fix it. Right. It would just go away. 
And part of what I want to say is actually when we move and we allow ourselves to breathe and feel what we're feeling and open up to those sensations and create a space where that's possible, mm -hmm. we will find impulses to move in us. Or in other which, ways, too. Exactly. Not repeating the same cycle, right? Right. So if we're constantly looking outside of ourselves for the solution, I, you know, there's a lot of good going on in the world, but if, if, if that good that's going on is causing us to look outside of ourselves rather than to open up, drop into our bodies, sense what we're sensing, and move with it, then we won't end up finding what we need to help us. We'll just keep looking for the next. Desire for one. food, big yes. problem. You talk about obesity. Oh, now, why is it a problem? Yeah, right. yeah, or the desire yeah. for food. No, the desire right? for food is not a problem. It's how we go about it, right? <laughs> right. We overdo it. Tell me about that, because that's really another, you're talking about major problems, right. depression, obesity in our country. Right, right. And this is, again, this is a place where I sort of focused in and said, what's the conversation going on here? What are the assumptions there? And what are people arguing about? So if you look at, in the diet culture, you get arguments about which diet's going to work. Is it going to be low fat? Is it going to be high protein? Is it going to be... And none of them no, work. Right. And, <laughs> none of them and work. And then on the other side, you have people saying, none of these di diets right. work. Actually, right. we need changes in public policy. We need to changes in drugs. So if you look at this whole argument, what's missing? What's missing is a sense that actually there is a wisdom in our bodily selves, a wisdom in our desire for food that actually can guide us towards a sense of enough. So I talk about how to shift our experience. That's a, that's a sort of category in the book, an experience shift, how we can shift our experience so we don't dis perceive our desires as the problem, but that we can actually see our desire for food, in this case, as leading us to find the arc of our pleasure and follow it to a sense of enough. Can you sort of give me an example of, th of that? Sure. Um, take a piece of chocolate cake, right? I love it. I love chocolate cake. I just cake. can't have it every day. <laughs> <laughs> no. And now, I mean, there, 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 there are lots of ways in which, uh, you know, we would feel a desire for chocolate cake, and it would pull us toward that chocolate cake. Now, what happens when you're sick, for example, or you're not feeling well? Then you don't really want the chocolate cake. And what happens if you're very full? Well, the chocolate cake just doesn't get, doesn't, Make you feel yes, as good. So, right. so part of what I try to do is to take this apart and say, okay, what is it about the chocolate cake that really gives you the sense of nourishment mm -hmm. that you want? And it's a relationship to that chocolate cake. It's a relationship that has rhythms to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just the fact of eating, but it's good, the fact of eating it in a time and place where you can open to that touch as nourishing you. And so part of what I try to do is to help people become aware of the qualities of food and the way that those affect them so that they can almost, so that they can be more in tune with the rhythms that, of their pleasure so that they can get the pleasure of the anticipation, the pleasure of the eating, and the pleasure of knowing that you've had enough. So, you know, obviously one of the reasons we overeat is emotional. Right. So how do we, again, go, how do we this control is, those emotions? It's such a good point. And, and lots of diet plans will tell you, don't eat for emotional reasons. Don't eat but, for, you know, you can't. But we do. But that's impossible. And right. part of what I talk about and what a body knows is that is my experience of watching my son, Kai, nurse, actually, and coming to the conclusion that, you know, nurture and nourish are forever entwined. They're entwined in the deepest first moments of our existence on this planet. And there's no way to separate them. We're always going to eat for nurture. Mm -hmm. And so when we accept that, then we can ask ourselves, what is it that's really going to give me the nurture I need? And if I'm feeling full and stuffing myself with food, that's not really giving me the nurture I need. That's right. trying to maybe suppress my pain. But so instead of controlling the emotions, it's actually about getting in touch with the emotion so that you can feel what it is that's going to nourish you. Well, what I get from this a lot is that, again, you have to be in touch with who you are and your body. Right. And to do that, you have to move and breathe. Right. Now, you talk about the abundance of sex and food in our yes. culture and how we are less and less satisfied with it. Right. Why is that happening? Is it because right. we're not in touch with our bodies? Yes, I think so. I think what happens is that there's so much stimuli. Uh, there's there's so so many things around us that are stimulating us to fee and 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 giving us the impression that if you eat this then you are going to be happy right. if you're going to get this kind of sex you are going to be, be happy and it's again once we've become disconnected with our bodies we're vulnerable to those kind of messages because we're looking but if we're always looking outside of us, again, we're going to miss the actual guidance that we have in us to help us. Now, you just mentioned a point that I think is really important, that it does take 
practice, right? This is not something that happens overnight, and some people can get frustrated with that. Well, I want a quick fix. We all want quick fixes, of course we do. But the fact is, if we, the, we're always practicing something anyway. Every moment of our lives, we're practicing something. Mm -hmm. And when we become conscious of that, we find our freedom. And we can ask ourselves, what is it that we want to practice? What is it that we want to actually get good at? What is it right. that we actually want to have register on our attention as important? And so that's an important part. So picking up a new hobby, where it's dancing or walking or moving, anything that requires right. movement is going to help. Because the mind over body, if we go about these issues, so I, I deal with oh. the issues of food and obesity and the issues of, of sex and relationships and the addition of depression and our spiritual lives. And part of the point I want to make is if we try to address any of these issues with a mind over body approach that I find the right idea and I impose it upon my body, then we're, we end up perpetuating the problem. We end up getting stuck in the very issue realm of sensations that we're trying to unfold. What do you think is we desire when we desire sex? Because you talk about that. Yes, what do I we do. really desire when we desire sex? Well, I think lots of things, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a very loaded <laughs> it's a question. Big question. <laughs> well, and it's also a question that can't be answered in one way of course, for one person. There are many ways, right. And even in our culture, our desire for sex, as with our desire for food and spirit, are, as I've been talking about, sort of trained, right? We develop them over time. It's not that we're born with a certain knowing that we want to have sex with X, Y, and Z. We're not, right? We learn that <laughs> right, over time. Right, it takes right. us years to figure right. out what it is that we desire when we desire sex. So what I do in the book is I sort of take apart some of the evolutionary biology that goes with that and try to look at the role of touch in our relationships. And I try to encourage people to make an experience shift again, where they interpret their desire for sex as something other than just a desire for physical pleasure. I think the message that we get that are harm, that I would say are harmful around sex is that it's easy mm -hmm. and that you can just do it. You can mm -hmm. do it for love or you cannot do it for love. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But somehow sex is a sort of instrumental. When it's with love, then that's a great moment, we right. think and we believe and we idealize. Right. We idealize, yeah. Um, but there's not a sense that our desire for sex is actually trying, is actually provides us with an opportunity to learn something about how to love. And in particular, I talk about how our desire for sex, perhaps we can think about it as a desire for being in a relationship where we're able to give and receive a life-enabling touch. Yeah, I like, I like this term. I've never heard enabling touch, the yes. importance of touch, touch. Yes. Give me an example yes. of what you're trying to say there. Touch, I Would think you say other cultures are more in tune with enabling touch? Like Europeans are more likely to hug than we are. We are <laughs> getting better at it, but we are. Remember right. Leo Buscaglia? He's the one that started with <laughs> let's hug, hug everybody, let's right? Let's hug. Exactly. You know. uh, is is that what you meant? In a way, it's intimacy. It's some kind of yes. you know, just physical, but spiritual and exactly. Okay. And part of what I want to say by touch is to sort of open up a discussion about what is it that enables you to feel touched, because. I think for different people, it's different. Right, some people don't like it. Right, and, for, and it does have a physical component. It always has a physical component, even if it's words. Words have a physical component, right? right. Or a gaze or a face or doing something together. So I want to open up people's experience about what could, it, what could touch be? What is a kind of contact between two people that enables an opening to one another? How do you define lifelong passion? Yes. Well... In, in, in formulating that expression as lifelong passion, I was looking around at the discussions about marriage and looking at the ideals that have come to the forefront of what marriage should be, especially in the 19th and 20th century. Well, something's going on because we have a 60% or higher divorce exactly. rate. Exactly, and it seemed like this, it seemed this paradox, again, that you have this ideal of a lifelong passionate love that two people meet because they, they choose one another, they love one another, and it's with that other person that they're going to find their emotional, spiritual, sexual forever. needs going to be no, met forever and ever. No pressure at all. No, no pressure at all. <laughs> so you have this ideal, but then you have this reality right. where so many people are having a difficulty making it work. So what, what's going on here? Right. And it's the same kind of thing with food where you have 
um, this, uh, these ideals of fitness and this, this billion dollar diet industry, but then you have rising levels of obesity. So part of what I wanted to say is there's a relationship between these two things, right? The fact that we have these ideals, so I, so I went in sort of, let's look at these ideals of marriage and let's look at how they function in different contexts. And again, I saw in these discussions uh, uh, ways of talking about sex that were instrumental. Right. right? The sex right. wasn't important to whether or not the love lasted. Uh -huh. And so part of what I want, and, and sex is easy, right? right? So part of what I wanted to sort of open up a discussion is, what if our sexual desire for one another is actually a lifelong process itself, right? A process of opening and unfolding to one another in ways that allow us to recreate that initial blast of openness that allowed us to know that this was a relationship that we wanted to continue. And what does that have to do with movement and, and moving throughout your life and not staying still? Yes. What does it have to do with it? So part of what I want to say in the realm of each one of these three desires is that by engaging in movement practices, using the breath to take us deep into our bodies, we can open up the possibility for these kinds of experience shifts where we realize that the desires that are arising in us have a wisdom, that they are impelling us to move in ways that actually coordinate our pleasure, our health, and our well-being. And so whether it's in relationship to food or whether it's in relationship to a partner, whether it's in relationship to your sense of who you are and what you want from this life, those impulses will be guiding you and you can learn to trust them. And you say that we need to be aware of what we need. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we have to be in tune, yes. right? And that's part of um, when I get into the talk about relationships, I, um, I talk about asking for what we need um, in a way that is paradoxical in this sense, that if we ask for what we need, we have more to give. I think when, when, when partners come together and they recognize each other, and it's a mutual desire to, stay, to, to, to begin to create a relationship together, it's because something, it, it's because the coming together awakens something in each one of them that they recognize as true to themselves and as what they want more of in their life. I want mm -hmm. to live in this space of openness where I feel so good. Right? But if you're not in touch with who you are, what you want, your body, you can't express what you need. Right. Well, and what happens is when we feel this positive feeling, we then attach to it. I want it. I want to feel this openness and this freedom. And so if then if I feel some kind of irritation or frustration with my parent, parent my partner, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, I will tend to try to suppress it for the good of the relationship. I won't share my emotions or I won't share what I'm feeling that might be troublesome or that might rock the boat. But what ends up happening is if we don't share what it is we're feeling, even if it's in relationship to the partner, is that we end up um, shrinking the areas of sensation that are open to the partner. So our desire has fewer and fewer spaces within us to pass through in our relationship. So the irony is that when you actually are, are open with your frustrations and you actually can welcome them as opportunities to go deeper with your partner, you end up growing the relationship. How do you know you're living smart? <laughs> you ask yourself, <laughs> are you breathing? Are you breathing? And you That's ask a good yourself one. that for two reasons. One, because you can say yes. Right. And whenever you can say yes to yourself, you know you're living smart. And the other is because when you ask yourself as you're, if, you're, if you are breathing and you say yes, it will also increase your attention of that breathing, Thank which you. will enable you to feel what you're feeling. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. And now on our green tips, we talk to glass recycler Mark Austin. Glass recycling is taking an item that people usually throw away and gets landfilled and uh, recycling it, putting it back into the economy or finding secondary uses for it, uh, either remaking it into bottles or using it for sandblast media. Uh, there are people that use recycled glass for art projects, for murals. Recycling glass uses about 75% less energy than making glass from scratch. Uh, making glass from scratch uses about 1.1 tons of material, whereas recycling uses virtually no material. And every ton of glass we recycle saves about 500 pounds of CO2 emissions. And CO2 is the number one greenhouse gas right now. And uh, glass can be recycled uh, indefinitely, which means there's never a time you cannot recycle glass. You can recycle glass uh, in a Honda if you have a car. <laughs> 
Uh, it's really easy to do, and it's really easy to make an impact doing it. Uh, I work just a few days a week, and this year I'll probably close out with about 300,000 pounds of glass, which has proven to me that one person can make a, a pretty dramatic difference, even working part-time. I encourage people to go out and do it. It saves tax dollars when you uh, recycle it instead of throwing it in a landfill. And obviously it saves the planet because you're not putting those, uh, the CO2 into the atmosphere. To learn more about green tips and what the body can teach us about ourselves, go to our website. There you'll find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Grass. Have a soulful week. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.